it's really my great pleasure to welcome you all to this Helsinki Distinguished Lecture uh, given by INF Achildes. My name is Sasu Tarkuma and I'm head of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Helsinki. And we have a really great uh, program now starting. And now some words about this lecture series. So uh, this series is about future information technology. And this is organized by the Helsinki Institute for Information Technology, HIIT, which is a joint uh, research institute between the University of Helsinki and Aalto University. And this series was launched in 2012. So there is already quite a lot of history uh, behind uh, this series. And of course, next year we have the full uh, decade uh, of, uh, of uh, events uh, organized under this uh, brand. So it's a very prominent uh, brand and we are very, very kind of uh, uh, honored that we have uh, these uh, really great uh, distinguished uh, keynote speakers uh, in, the, in the program. And uh, the focus here uh, with the lecture series is to um, consider research challenges and solutions uh, that uh, are faced by uh, current and also future information technology. And, uh, and this is really uh, ICT oriented, but of course we, we, can, uh, we can expand also beyond ICT uh, in the content as well. And, uh, and the lectures are uh, intended to be uh, approachable for people uh, with scientific education in other fields than ICT. And also uh, we, we hope that uh, uh, also ICT experts gain a lot of insight uh, from the lectures as well. So, so across the board, uh, the aim is to, to foster new, new, new thinking and new ideas and discuss those. And now, um, before continuing, so uh, some uh, very brief uh, updates from uh, the Helsinki ICT community. So uh, we have good news uh, from Helsinki and from HIIT. So the community has been growing over the years. And uh, we have activities such as the Academy of Finland flagship Finnish Center for AI, FCAI. And we have the Helsinki Center for Data Science, High Data, and many other centers that have been established and that have been growing and organizing many activities. So uh, there is a lot of uh, buzz now in ICT in Helsinki. And uh, stay tuned for updates about our new events and activities. I believe that we have an exciting program planned uh, for the fall. Now uh, about the webinar organization. So uh, we have uh, the distinguished lecture being recorded and the recording will be available after the webinar uh, online on the lecture series web pages. And also uh, we have the chat. So please use the chat for your questions and comments. So we will then uh, pick up uh, the questions for discussion uh, uh, from the chat uh, towards the uh, end of the uh, event. So now uh, we can continue. Uh, the title of the distinguished lecture is a new CubeSat design with reconfigurable multiband radios for dynamic spectrum access in Internet of Space Things. And uh, INF Achilles is currently uh, the president and CTO of Truva Inc. And uh, he has many distinguished research leader and advisory roles globally. And he has established many research centers, for example, in Spain, South Africa, uh, in Germany, Russia, India, Cyprus, and so on. And uh, also in Finland, he has been very active. So uh, he had a FIDI Pro professor position uh, at Tampere. Uh, Tampere University of Technology at the time, and uh, he was creating a center there as well. And that is how I know Ian, uh, that we, we kind of uh, had a number of joint meetings, and he actually gave a keynote at University of Helsinki during uh, this time uh, when he was Philip, Philip Pro professor. And it was a very, very nice talk about bio nano uh, uh, research uh, going on at the time. And I believe that was one example of, of his pioneering research. So he has been advancing many uh, different areas uh, in ICT and uh, spearheading uh, these uh, new fields like bio, nano, and, um, and, and so on. So many, many uh, really uh, foundational contributions uh, in these different areas uh, within ICT. 
and uh, he has many uh, associate uh, affiliate professor uh, roles and many other senior roles uh, uh, at the moment. And uh, since 2021, he has the title of docent at the University of Helsinki. So we are very happy to, to have him also affiliated with the University of Helsinki. And uh, he is the Ken Byers Chair Professor Emeritus in Telecommunications at the Georgia Institute of Technology and uh, also uh, an IEEE Fellow, ACM Fellow, and he has received numerous awards uh, from IEEE, ACM, and also other professional organizations. And one uh, notable achievement is the Humboldt Award from Germany, a very distinguished award. He is highly cited scientist with age index of 130, and uh, he has made, as mentioned, many seminal contributions. And now today we hear about one of these areas, we hear about the Internet of Space things. So welcome, Ayan. The stage is yours. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Sasu, for this very kind and uh, nice introduction. It has been almost uh, 10 years now when I came to University of Helsinki and gave a talk, as you remember. And it's again a, a great pleasure to be with you and your university and your people. And I'll be uh, giving you about this talk, uh, most like CubeSats. And uh, let me tell you how I got into this. Uh, you know, many young people see, uh, you know, suddenly uh, people start to work on something. And it's not like I wake up some morning and say, oh, bionic things are really interesting. Let me get started. It's not like that. So this new the CubeSat research, the background story uh, is uh, 2016, I was invited by University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. So uh, I uh, visited uh, AAFRL, Air Force Research Lab in Albuquerque. And I knew about CubeSats. And uh, when they demonstrated me the CubeSats, I was really uh, intrigued and excited. And I said, I will start uh, to regenerate uh, my satellite research. Why? Because I used to do a lot of research on satellites in the 90s and early 2000s and supported by NSF and NASA and Department of Defense. But then in 2004, I got out. And, and then after this, uh, I said, I have to go back CubeSats because, and, uh, you know, they have really, uh, future and also uh, I tried to find some uh, angles to come in, right? So that's another thing I recommend to the young people. When you see something like, uh, for example, this is really funny now about this uh, reconfigurable intelligent surfaces, right? Now it's like wildfire, everybody writes papers, that's really wrong approach, you know? So you must find some angle and to make an impact, right? So uh, let's, let me start to, uh, 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 you know, put this uh, research also into perspective. And uh, I know that Finland is extremely active in all generations, not only 6G. Uh, they also wrote tons of papers. So uh, this paper I wrote in my two last uh, PhD students, they graduated uh, in April. And it took us two years to uh, uh, prepare that. And we want to put the 5G into perspectives to the 6G or vice versa, right? So uh, the peak data rates will be jumping from 20 gigabit per second to one terabit per second. Peak spectral efficiency will jump from 30 to 60 bits per second per Hertz. And the latency is really the biggest headache uh, or one of the biggest headaches in 5G. All the operators are struggling with meeting these end-to-end -end latency limits. And now uh, from one millisecond, we wanna go to open one millisecond. It's like surreal objective and cell edge data rates are expected from 0.1 to 1 gigabit per second and reliability should uh, go to from 10 minus 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 9 like for example ultra uh, url ultra reliable low latency communications right reliable and end-to-end -end latency that's the biggest part of the, one of the biggest parts in 5g it will also be part of 6g so having all these objectives we need to do something for the architectures, right? For the networks themselves. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of people, as I told you, wrote tons of papers. 
and we wanted to again find new angles right so we don't we didn't want to uh, repeat what other people say and then of course you know you cannot avoid total overlaps right so for example terahertz band uh, we just had a, a panel on monday so i started that research like 15 years ago and and now a lot of people walk up and say oh terahertz and band is really interesting and i was pawned uh, like 15 years ago when i gave keynotes that's like a, a science fiction. And, and now everybody's in terahertz band. Right? I'm talking about from the communications perspective. And then uh, these uh, uh, space things, cube sets, I call them Internet of Space Things, will be like also drones and all this stuff. And plus all the satellites will play a great role in the 6G and beyond systems. And this is very interesting, uh, reconfigurable. That's not in the... Uh, <laughs> yeah surfaces that are here. So these are front ends, right? That you can do dynamic spectrum access and independent of what type of frequency bands you have. It's like hardware design and of course all the protocols you need it. And then all the surfaces, uh, ambient backscatter communications, and of course AI and uh, STN NFV will continue to be the uh, major uh, technology for 5G, but also in 6G and the slicing, uh, automatic slicing will uh, take more, uh, a bigger role in the 6G systems. And you see below here, uh, quantum communications uh, are up and coming, but you know, I'm personally, I could give a talk about that or a panel at up and coming since 20 years, but it's not coming, unfortunately. <laughs> and internet of bio and other things, it's really uh, uh, becoming very, very hot topic. As uh, uh, Sasha mentioned, I also started this like 15 years ago and Internet of Nano Things. So the, I, I call these more tours to 7G, right? So why satellite networks? Uh, believe it or not, this slide is like 22 years old uh, and this is still uh, useful. <coughs> uh, wide uh, geographical area coverage. Uh, we can go to from kilobit per second to terabit per second now. You know, we can really go. You will see why. And then we can do uh, uh, faster deployments, uh, depending again you know, how you look at it. And you can do offloading, right, to the uh, from terrestrial to the uh, uh, space part. And you can support the symmetrical and asymmetrical architectures. And it's easy or easier to integrate them with terrestrial networks, all types of networks, right? And those years we not have this many uh, uh, networks uh, on the terrestrial level. Now it's like unbelievable, right? So, so you can have a flexible bandwidth on demand capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all interesting uh, issues. And 1998, for example, we had this Iridium project and also Teledesic from uh, uh, Bill Gates. And, uh, uh, and then we had Motorola, remember also the uh, Celeste. So that was really hot and coming. And then, you know, even uh, uh, those guys were planning to have the entire backbone network to be a satellite networks, but then it uh, died down. And there are many reasons, but it's not like uh, our uh, topic here now. So uh, there are these uh, um, orbits uh, defining the uh, uh, notion of the satellites. For example, there are these so-called geo, geosynchronous earth orbit satellites, uh, they are like uh, hovering around like 36,000 kilometers, meaning 22,000 miles. And they're also called geosynchronous or global earth orbit. Some people call them like that. And then there is this uh, 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 Van Allen belt. belt. Uh, the uh, uh, radiation is so high that you have to avoid these Van Allen belts. That's why I have those dots. And then there are medium earth orbit satellites and uh, uh, low earth orbit satellites, as you see here. And again, uh, you know, their distances from the earth are defining their orbits. And then also there's this inner Van Allen belt. So uh, like, for example, you can have three geos to cover the entire earth and Mio, like you can go like 10 Mio's. And then uh, with Leo's, for example, Iridium at 66 uh, and uh, uh, satellites with uh, uh, 11 orbits and, uh, uh, or yeah, six uh, uh, satellites in each orbit. So, uh, uh, so you can see that this is already existing and, uh, you know, it's working. And the, the 
uh, propagation delays are also playing a role. Like for example, geos have uh, approximately 271 millisecond going up and down the propagation delay. And that's why they are not the best for real time communications, for example, there will be always echoes, right? And then, you know, uh, the other ones are also here. I don't want to go through all of that. Again, this is not a satellite lecture, I mean, uh, teaching. So uh, the issue here is that uh, uh, each of these satellites has a different uh, uh, set of applications. Okay. And, and uh, 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 so you also see this ammonia that's like a very interesting uh, elliptic uh, case that was by the Soviet Union to do spying on USA and then uh, anyhow. So, uh, so that was also interesting, uh, you know, uh, hovering around the earth. So uh, most of them are using the so-called uh, narrow band systems, L band, S band, C bands, and X bands, like uh, downlink and uplink, you see those here. And then of course, uh, they are in these uh, frequency bands and also their uh, data rates are pretty low. And, uh, and, uh, and then we have also these wideband systems like KU bands and KA bands. And they are, you know, higher frequency bands. Like we have 36 megahertz for KU band. Bandwidth in six, 50 to 60 megahertz per seconds can be reached. And KA bands are also having these 500 megahertz bandwidth that we can, we can reach multiple gigabit per seconds. And we have other you know, newer frequency bands like V bands and, uh, and Q bands around 40 to uh, 50, 60 gigahertz. And this is the uh, frequency band allocations for the satellites. And of course, some of them are overlapping, right? So like you can use uh, multiple of these. So uh, now we are, I'm trying to bring it to the CubeSats, right? What are the disadvantages? Although we have a well-established satellite technology, so uh, unfortunately, the cycles for developments and deployments are very long. It takes approximately seven years. And also, uh, they are using this old uh, uh, technology, we call this closed architecture, meaning you have to uh, put the software on these devices, and then you are locking into certain vendors and you have no space to move around. It was the same with the cellular systems, right? Now with SDN, software defined networking, we can get out of this closed architectures and same thing will happen in the satellites too. And then the costs for constructions and launching are enormous as you see here, some numbers. And then also the risk is very high. For example, the uh, Hitomi telescope failure uh, in 2016 caused $300 million uh, waste and 10 years of uh, research life. So uh, now these small satellites are uh, up and coming. Again, it took really a long time. I will give you the uh, background story on that. So based on their uh, masses, uh, they are categorized as mini satellites, like 100 to 180 kilogram, micro satellites, 10 to 100, and nano satellites or CubeSats, one to 10 kilograms, and PICO and FEMTA satellites are also here. So this is the category for the small satellites. You can see a picture of like, you need thousands of them for the coverage, right? So, uh, uh, so I, as I told you, after I uh, visited the AFRL and I said, why, you know, uh, again, this was the vision of, uh, 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 Bill Gates and uh, at talk, so many of you may not know, there are many hidden heroes in this research world. He, he was like the guru of the space technology at talk. He died uh, recently. So anyhow, so they wanted to have always these uh, back, you know, backbone network uh, uh, or core network actually. So I said, why don't we do also these uh, uh, CubeSats as uh, and create uh, internet of space things, you know, because there will be multiple of them and they can do much better than the existing technology. Uh, uh, however, I did not uh, have the idea saying, oh, we can forget Leos and Geos and Mios, that's crazy, right? I mean, that's like uh, nonsense, but it's kind of like complementary technology add on plus the drones, that would be fantastic to have this space, right? So uh, what is this CubeSat? So I told you it's up and coming, right? 
So uh, the idea was uh, uh, by uh, uh, old uh, former NASA uh, guy, uh, he was teaching at California State University. Normally, you know, when you know all the uh, top research is coming from the top 10 schools, right? And so uh, it was from California State University. So, uh, uh, and you know, it took some years, right? So, so that it will take off. So the, uh, this is like a cube and the unit is like one U meaning 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters, like a mug size that you see a picture here. And you know, if you have three U meaning 30 by 30 by 30 centimeters and or five U, so you can imagine. So this is the simple uh, architecture. And also if you have some hardware, uh, you know, hobby interests, it's extremely easy to uh, uh, produce these CubeSats. And what are the advantages? They are scalable and they are flexible. They can also work with uh, drones and UAVs and also of course other satellites. And you can build them with commercial off the shelf components. I'm talking about what is existing. Now you will see that uh, my new suggestions, so uh, that's not that you know, straightforward anymore. And uh, the ones that I will present to you, right? And uh, the development to deployment cycles will be short and you can have a great potential for mass productions. And you can see here, the launching is exponentially growing the last 10 years. Like you see a picture here and it's getting uh, more and more. So you can read here. So there is a, also a, a, a business potentials by the way. So there are many, many use cases and uh, so it's not just for uh, research interests, but you know you can uh, people can make money out of it, as you will see some of the deployed architecture. So what are the uh, functional components? Again, this is an abstract picture. We have these typical electrical power systems, battery, solar panels, command and data handling system, processors and memories, attitude determination control because they will be hovering, circling around, right? And they will be having a bunch of sensors. And then uh, payloads, uh, you can have very powerful cameras and uh, GPS receivers. And then communication subsystems, they are mostly like, you know, S-bands. I will give you some uh, more information uh, what they are capable of. This is a typical abstract picture of a CubeSat architecture. So now there are existing networks. In fact, I had the uh, years, but, you know, I updated this uh, figure. And uh, you know you can uh, uh, take my word on it. These are the last three, two, three, four years. So it's really uh, you know brand new technology. So there are all these different countries like uh, ELS, Switzerland, Astrocast, Australia, Fleet, Canada, Kepler. So you can read them here as they're all here. And maybe I'm sure that you have also something in Finland because you have some rural areas, you may need them, right? And there are different uh, purposes. Majority of them are like IoT applications and uh, like Kepler has also a satellite backhaul uh, system. And then uh, uh, like the US Planet Labs use, is using it for earth imaging. But you know, the, the uh, point here is the most that they're using for IoT cases on the uh, ground segment. And then some of them can uh, communicate hopping around between them. It's called intersatellite links. And some of them uh, don't for the time being. So then there are orbital altitudes because they are, again, as I said, CubeSats, they are much closer to Earth than the LEOs. And, you know, of course, not LEOs. So they are like uh, around 420 to, uh, let's say, 600 kilometers, again, below uh, inner Van Allen belt and also closer. Of course, because they're closer, we need uh, much more uh, uh, or many satellites, right? For example, here, uh, 64, 100, 140, et cetera. But now here's another thing that I found out. I mean, that was, remember I tried to find an angle. So with these numbers, there is no way that you will have anytime, anywhere coverage, right? You know, 64. So what's happening is like a cloud, you know, it's not, I'm ta not talking about computer science cloud, right? So it's like these uh, 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 CubeSats will be on top of, let's say, Finland, and they cover for a certain amount of time and they move out and they have to come back, right? 
So it's not all the time. So you have to come back until they're above the above Finland, for example. So that's why they have very small number of uh, satellites. It's not because continuous coverage. I will mention that uh, as one of the disadvantages. And their weights are going uh, well with these uh, uh, cube sets uh, uh, dimensions. And operating frequency, you can see here, they are using like UHF bands, L bands, S bands, and uh, like Kepler uses K and KU bands. Again, most of them are compartmentized, you know, like, you know, as you say, as you see here, K A band or S band, etc. And then their uh, 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 form, uh, the uh, units are like 3U, 12U, 2U, etc. So I, I hope that th this will give you, this is giving you a big picture about existing systems. By the way, I have to notice that uh, there are more, I mean, uh, this is maybe tip of the iceberg, right? So I cannot cover uh, all of these things. So if your system is not here, please accept my apology. And that's the problem when you give talks and then you don't mention somebody and they get upset, right? So what are the limitations? Uh, so I mentioned this already, lack of continuous global coverage. And because they are uh, operating in those data rates, I'm sorry, uh, uh, frequency bands, the data rates are low. Like some of them are in kilobit per second, uh, or very low megabit per seconds, and Kepler can go up to 40 megabit per second. I'm sure there's a typo. And uh, so, but still, you know, the overall conclusion is they have low data rates. And uh, they do not have publicly available solutions for large scale network constellation. And uh, then also, the existing solutions rely far too much on distributed onboard path computation, meaning onboard uh, processing, it's called. So this is one of the problems from the last, you know, generations of the satellites, LEOs. Uh, everything was like, you know, put, put on these satellites and the technology was progressing. It was not easy to update them all the time, right? So that's why uh, you will see we have also this new suggestion about uh, using on, uh, uh, you know, uh, SDN technologies that, uh, these CubeSats will be just bare bone uh, hardware. Uh, you will see that in the second part. So uh, serving a variety of use cases with different quality of service requirements, data routing for ultra dense CubeSat systems is a major problem. I mentioned to you some of them are not even uh, uh, looking at these uh, uh, intersatellite links. And another issue here is actually that's the uh, angle that another angle that I try to come in is the millimeter wave bands, right, uh, are, uh, you know, playing a major role for 5G systems since many years, although it's not there what it's supposed to be, honestly, that's like another disappointment, but still, uh, you know, millimeter wave bands are used uh, with all these problems and terahertz bands are up and coming. And I was thinking that's why, you know, I was doing this research on terahertz. Uh, and uh, you will see there are atmospheric effects on the ground segment. And I thought there are no atmospheric effects in the space. Why don't I go to terahertz band and use the intercellular links in the terahertz band? So that was another novelty that I came in. And, and also, as I told you, they're mostly using these uh, uh, conventional, you know, like uh, limited ba uh, frequency bands here, like L bands and et cetera. Right? I mentioned this to you. So now here is the uh, 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 architecture that uh, it's already known. Uh, this is like the cube sets, a certain number of cube sets. Again, you will see uh, we want that we will have uh, anytime, uh, uh, anywhere coverage. So we have also study for that. So how many cube sets we need to cover the earth all the time. So and, and space segment, and then they have these intercell links to communicate. And we have the ground segment. And the ground segment, we are mostly interested in the IOTs. You know, there are so many Internet of Things deployments, and they played a major role for 5G and also will continue for 6G. So we wanted to also use these IOTs on the Earth, but also these CubeSats uh, as uh, uh, like sensors, right? They can have imaging uh, uh, sensors, for example, 
or some other sensing components I showed you before. And then they, you know, uh, the areas that uh, we cannot reach, rural areas, they can uh, collect all the information uh, through these CubeSats and then download to, for example, customer premises, right? Doing hop and hop. So this is the classical architecture. And there are many use cases of these internal of space things. They can be used as backhaul in the sky, right? This is, let's say, this is the space segment, right? And uh, remote areas connectivity, as I mentioned to you before, uh, including North and South Poles, pervasive tracking, anything you can imagine, right? In, like in a, a, a ship on the, in the Pacific Ocean, for example. In emergency infrastructure after natural disasters, like tsunamis, earthquakes, etc. Network security concern in terrestrial networks, we can offload them. Or if the, uh, the terrestrial networks are congested, we can offload them to the space. And you can also use them eyes in the sky, doing terrain monitoring and also disaster prevention monitoring. In fact, there is a, uh, an interesting uh, case. Uh, I had a slide for it. There is this Millennium Tower in San Francisco. As some of you may know, San Francisco is extremely expensive. Like a one bedroom apartment may cost you like 10, $15 million. And there is this Millennium uh, skyscraper. And they observe that from the uh, uh, satellites, uh, uh, geoscience people, that it's tilting, like, you know, a new Pisa tower. And that was, uh, you know, detected by these uh, uh, eyes in the sky uh, application. And, and then you can also do cyber physical integration with CubeSats, Leos and Geos and Mios and drones. So that will be a, a you know, fantastic uh, uh, framework of these uh, technologies. You can do all these uh, uh, internet access for undeveloped areas. And, and you know, it's really interesting. Uh, we, we are in the US and I took uh, Uber, you know, in the good times, right? When I, I used to travel a lot. So the guy was living like maybe uh, 15 kilometers from me and here in Georgia, right? He said, they don't have internet access. Can you imagine this? It's really sad, really, I'm not kidding. So he was using his cell phone for, you know, internet access. Aerial photography, product delivery, surveillance, and drone traffic monitoring. So these are the typical examples of this. So let's come to this uh, again, the novelties that uh, I, uh, you know, wanted to get, get in. So we have this paper published in 19. Of course, it takes some time, right? Uh, you know, you, it's not like you have an idea and then you go to the bathroom and you come out and you write a paper, right? Some people do, unfortunately. <laughs> But it took us two, three years to start to produce, right? So we have this uh, UB cube, uh, we say dimensions are three U. And then uh, you can see here, and weight are five kilogram and no propulsion systems. And you see here solar panels. And then there are, of course, new ideas. That are, that's what I will uh, uh, present to you. Like there is this uh, um, uh, uh, reconfigurable front end design with uh, multi-band antenna array, et cetera. So uh, what are the novelties in our design? So you can see this, we don't touch anything on the left-hand side. The communication subsystem will have multi-frequency front-end design. Uh, that, uh, that said, that means we have all these uh, spectrum bands available to us and whatever is available, uh, the front-end will be able to lock into one of these or a couple of these and transmit. And so that's the uh, one. And the other one is the multi-frequency antenna design. And uh, we have flexible phi and link layer design. And you will see you have ultramassive MIMO, very large number of antennas, and a bunch of dynamic resource allocation algorithms. And plus we have the STN and NFE architecture, which I will present to you in the second half. So now what are the uh, little bit more details? I mentioned to you about these front ends, right? So multi uh, uh, dynamic multi-frequency uh, fr front ends. So now, first of all, the, uh, there are no atmospheric effects in the, in the space. So when you uh, know about millimeter waves, the oxygen particles are the enemies for the path losses. Right, and then you know, uh, like non-line of sight, or when you have longer distances, the oxygen particles kill the signals. 
So same thing in terrorist band, the water particles are the enemies. So like when you go to higher and higher frequencies, then uh, the water particles affect the signal propagation and then you become distance limited. So that's why since 10 years I work on terahertz band, how to combat the distances. That's why I started research on reconfigurable intelligence surfaces. It was not like, you know, oh, let me start to write a paper on this that many people do, unfortunately. You know? So uh, that was the background story. And I thought, uh, can we now people are also saying I can use also uh, surfaces for uh, uh, space. <laughs> yeah, so let's continue. Uh, uh, so now, uh, uh, so that's the thing that for the space segment, we have a uh, higher frequency band. For ground to up segments, that's the problem, right? Because we have atmospheric effects. A bunch of these atmospheric layers will affect the single propagation. So for that, we are saying, look, from the ground segment to up, we have all these available frequency bands that are already there, but also we may have these millimeter wave bands, even terrorist frequency bands. There are these sub windows. Again, when you uh, study more about terrors, you will see it. there are sub windows that you can use, maybe the uh, data rates are below, but who cares? So you can use sub windows and have longer distances. So that's why we say for ground to space segment, we can use truly these dynamic uh, front ends, but also we need them here too, right? Because they have between each other, they will talk, uh, communicate in frequency, uh, high frequency bands and up and down, they will go to down to these uh, uh, lower frequency bands, right? So, uh, uh, so, uh, the multi-frequency uh, uh, front end I'm talking about is between one gigahertz to one terahertz. We are trying to design, implement an optimal to operate frequency agile, ultra broadband, broadband reconfigurable system to communicate over the spectrum ranging between one to one gigahertz to one terahertz. And our objectives are maximizing spectrum utilization, maximizing data rates, and also the user capacities. And uh, so, then, uh, so uh, why millimeter waves in terrorist band in ISLs? Uh, I already explained to you about these atmospheric effects uh, are uh, uh, not there uh, for oxygen or also water particles, number one. Number two, uh, you have seen, that's why I showed in the beginning, uh, the 6G systems have very, very high requirements. Like for example, very high data rates, right? and very low latencies. So we can use these uh, uh, cube sets or you know, these uh, uh, technology in the higher frequency bands to achieve those objectives of the 6G, right? So uh, what are the design ideas for reconfigurable multi-frequency transceiver? We have a three metrics way in the design to generate signals at various frequency bands. Uh, first, dimension constraints, and of course, power source and energy consumption and achievable performance. Actually, we have two designs. Please look at the paper and we apply for patents. Uh, multi, I will just explain a multi-stream electronic frequency up conversion chains. So that's the, uh, uh, in a nutshell, you know, quick as possible that, you know, you have these typical uh, hardware components, right? Low noise amplifiers and, uh, 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 single source, uh, frequency multipliers, splitters, etc. right? And these antennas here. So uh, the general idea is we use these frequency splitters to divide the output signal, uh, I'm sorry, input signal into two identical uh, output signals after frequency multipliers. Okay, there are these frequency multipliers, right? And uh, they generate an output signal with frequency as a multiple of its input frequency, okay? We, they're usually implemented as chains of frequency doublers or triplers. So what we do here is to extract intermediate frequencies for the outputs. As you see here, these are the outputs. And signals at F1 is considered as the intermediate output when producing signals at a higher frequency F2, for example. And we can do these uh, uh, 
structures in a cascaded fashion. I show you two cases here. We can do multiple of these. That's one of these ideas. So in other words, signals at different frequencies are generated by a chain of frequency multipl multiplication and up conversion. So this is one path we are taking, but we have another path we are working on. It's not ready for the presentation. Uh, we are trying to use, we call this universal software defined radios. So some of you will get the idea hopefully, but hopefully. So anyhow, so uh, we will take that approach also and uh, apply for patenting, et cetera. Okay. And next question was about multi-frequency antenna systems. Uh, like uh, physically reconfigurable antennas for various resonant frequencies, like to using NAMS and MAMS technologies. The problems with this uh, design is delay associated to control these NAMS MAMS systems, and especially when we target very high data rates. Also, the size integration complexity of NAMS uh, for the terahertz band antennas. That's the uh, experience we had before. So we have also these graphene-based plasmonic nano-antenna arrays. Uh, we have a patent for them. I will present you a couple slides here. And then another uh, design is here, electronically controlled tunable phase reflect array antenna. So we can uh, dynamically adjust radiation patterns and uh, this will be much cheaper and simpler uh, uh, production. And as it's also it's suitable for the CubeSat cases. So now, uh, again, I revisit this thing here, right? So now uh, I talked about these multiband antenna array systems and the front end design a little bit. Okay, so now uh, you can see this multiband reconfigurable antenna array is that uh, we are using, again, based on our past experience, plasmonic reflector antennas, uh, and uh, they can efficiently radiate at target resonant frequencies. Uh, like plasmonic resonators in millimeter wave bands and terahertz plasmonic patch for the higher frequency bands, like, you know, sub terahertz and terahertz. And they have uh, very uh, small uh, uh, wavelengths, like here. And uh, because we are using graphene material on top of the dielectric material, again, that was our past uh, research. And, uh, uh, and then you can pack a lot of these elements into uh, smaller areas and the, 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 the uh, interference will, can be avoided. Usually you need some uh, uh, long distance between these elements, right? Because of these uh, uh, small wavelengths here. And then multiband communications can be realized with suppressed mutual coupling effect. We also did a lot of research on this. So now we can do like uh, signal propagation through wave steering and polarization tuning. And also you can uh, direct these reflect area antennas. Like, uh, so uh, this research was based on this uh, uh, work that uh, we did many years ago. We've got patent in 2017. Uh, you can see uh, uh, plasmonic nano antennas and you can have uh, 32 by 32 antenna elements in total of 1024 elements. And you know, uh, graphene sits on top of this dielectric material. And uh, we showed many, many times uh, uh, through uh, uh, simulations, uh, unfortunately, the fabrication is still not done. And uh, like COMSOL simulations, for example, that it really uh, brings uh, uh, very promising results, ultramassive MIMO. So he was my former student. He's now in Northeastern and he's very active continuing his research. And he's trying to be the god of his field, right? Thanks to him. <laughs> so anyhow, so Shuai uh, is uh, my last PhD student. We did some uh, research on dynamic ultramassive MIMO for intelligent beam forming. You can see you can have certain sub arrays. They can uh, create their own beam forms. You can do multi beaming. Of course, you can also apply to machine learning algorithms and put some intelligence there. And uh, like you can see here, we did that in this paper in ICASP or they all work together. They can create single focus beam. There's some people call it pencil sharp. Some people call it razor sharp. So all these elements work together and then you reach very long distances, right? And you can also have these multi-band ultramassive MIMO. Uh, this was also in uh, our uh, same paper about uh, heterogeneous frequency bands in other words, right? You can see some of these uh, array elements can be locked into different frequency bands. 
so uh so this is the basic idea about that and uh so uh, let's look back to the, uh, I hope you got the point about hardware design, right? So if not, then please uh, read the paper. There are many more details. And of course we did some more extra work, but you know, they're not published yet. So, uh, so let's look at the space segment, right? Because we are talking about, we're using high frequency bands and uh, they will, uh, uh, you know, uh, hop the traffic, you know, one-to-one, -one, uh, I mean, hop by hop. So we, we try to uh, reach high throughput, low latency, and the propagation distances can be, you know, again, vary. These are not uh, solid numbers, by the way. So I just gave you some numbers here. And uh, in atmosphere, uh, five kilometer above ground, the atmospheric density is negligible. That means no atmospheric attenuation molecular absorption, as I told you. And uh, uh, we can also use for the up and down these lower frequency bands, right? And uh, so uh, let's look at the link budget analysis, which we did some simulations with different uh, 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 orbits and 500 to 900 kilometers, different input parameters. And you can see here minimum required antenna or minimum required gain in intercellular links at the receiver in order to maintain a 10 dB SNR. So these are the transmission distances and these are the different frequency bands. Of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the antenna gain is very high when we go higher and higher frequency bands, right? So that's the intercellular links case. And uh, for link budget analysis, again, intercellular links in terms of mag maximum antenna uh, beam width required at receiver side, again, in intercellular links, in order to maintain 10 dB SNR. And you see here again, we have uh, uh, here the uh, one terahertz and then 60 gigahertz, the solid blue line. So it, it's going to an asymptotic value uh, depending on the transmission distance. And uh, it shows also the maximum antenna beam width, uh, which is required for inter intercellular links. So what are the lessons we learned from this study? There are more, uh, Funk graphs, but anyhow, so uh, we can uh, have higher gains when we increase the transmission frequency band. You know, you have seen it, right? Even in the absence of atmospheric losses. For a 500 megahertz bandwidth, the, since the channel is symmetrical, the gain at each transmitter end is always under 50 dB, which can be achievable with antenna technologies. When we increase the channel bandwidth by an order of magnitude, that will also increase the required gain by 10 dB. And the distance between CubeSats not only influences the coverage of the Earth's surface, but also affects the achievable data rates. Okay. So we did similar way, the uh, 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 link budget analysis for the ground satellite links. The problem is, again, we have atmospheric attenuation and molecular absorption, right? Going up and down. So we need highly directional high gain antennas, right? So now we can uh, have dynamic modulation coding schemes for example, to ground stations, we can use millimeter waves with simpler modulation coding systems since the bandwidth will be large. For the ground sensors, the like IoT components, we can use lower frequency bands with more complicated modulation coding schemes. It's kind of like dynamic case. So that's like, we, I sh we show you here that uh, when we have these frequency is increasing, the data rates are also increasing and that's also expected, you know, that there is nothing new uh, revealed here in this case. So now uh, you have seen, I talked about the, uh, uh, this hardware design, the new ideas about all these dynamic uh, front ends. And then we did some link budget analysis and I showed you some of these uh, research uh, components and also what are open issues. So now we are coming to the yet another uh, uh, angle for the novelty. As many of you know, also uh, uh, Sasu's group is doing a lot of research on STN and FE. So uh, we were thinking, uh, you know, when I came back from uh, New Mexico, I thought, uh, can we use STN and FE also for the, uh, these CubeSats? And indeed, uh, we have this idea, we call it IST hub, it's like controller. Again, I know I, I assume that you know what the controllers are. 
and then they can be in one location or in distributed locations. That's another issue, right? So they have all these, like uh, I will talk to you about those, like slice controller, virtualization manager, and all these things that I will present to you. They'll be on the ground segment, right? And then all these areas are on the ground set, you know, ground. And then these cube sets are just bare bone uh, uh, devices that. Uh, will, uh, you know, the control will, you know, signal to them what to do. Uh, and then, you know, they will uh, forward the traffic from one end to another, for example. So that's this typical STN and uh, idea, right? So uh, why uh, STN, right? So first of all, I mentioned this to you before, the uh, old fashioned uh, way of architectures are close vendor specific, right? Like for example, in the uh, cellular systems, like uh, I call them Magnificent Seven. Some of them died, unfortunately. Uh, like Nokia, your company, and also Ericsson, they are another Magnificent Seven people. That was all closed, right? Uh, and this hampered innovation. So now, uh, so the, the STN opens up the architecture, right? It's this open architecture. CubeSets, I told you, they can be built uh, commercial off the shelf components with all these advantages and uh, limited onboard processing. That means we try not to put a lot of software on them using SDN. So that means if we use SDN and FE, we will enable open flexible architecture and uh, they will be perfect for CubeSats. And uh, there are many uh, futures, uh, dynamic and scalable network configuration, right? And they can be physically distributed by logically centralized control framework and uh, intelligent routing, optimal network resource utilization. So we need all of these uh, that will be running on the ground segment, right? In the controllers, controller or controllers, you know, policy-based network control and support for data aggregation, meaning a lot of traffic is uh, collected and we can do also these aggregation of these very high volume of traffic. That's one of the headaches in the Internet of Things. And satellite infrastructure as a service, we can do network virtualization through slicing, uh, right? Or slicing for network virtualization. And the tenants can control, optimize, and customize the underlying infrastructure without owning it and complete isolation between different tenants. These are also known in the uh, you know, terrestrial networks too, right? So then also uh, another future is generic solution for ubiquitous connectivity. That means you can connect uh, physical objects, remote sensing devices, vehicles, ships, buildings, whatever you can think of, right? And it can support different environments, near earth, terrestrial, underwater, underground, whatever you can think of, right? And security provision, you can have identity-based authentication scheme and uh, robust access policy framework and secure remote access. So now we have this uh, 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 controller design. So you can see there's a northbound and southbound, right? So we have this infrastructure layer and uh, like here, I will talk about those a little bit. Management and control rate layer here and policy and orchestration layer, uh, policy layer and, uh, and security and privacy sublayer here. And each of them has certain uh, subcomponents. As I told you, they are all open architecture. You can develop your own or you, know, you can get it from third party and then you can put them into these uh, uh, controllers. So when you look at these a little bit more in detail, control management layer, like you can see here, uh, they are responsible for network orchestration and control. Uh, they control operation of indirect access segment and uh, cube sets. And they have like network database, slice controller, network controller, uh, orchestration operations controller. So these are all uh, part of this uh, control and management sub layer. So now let us look at this uh, network, uh, uh, I, uh, <laughs> IST network base. So it has, uh, 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 it's again deployed at the controller on the ground segment and it maintains network status information. And it contains a lot of information like about ground satellite links, 
intracellular links, CubeSats, orbital planes, et cetera, et cetera. They're all stored in that database. And slice controller for the slicing, right? Uh, uh, they support multi-tenancy through network slicing. And each slice is characterized by service level agreements. I should have some slides on this latency and throughput, uh, just examples for the uh, uh, requirements or objectives for the slicing and radio resource and computing resource requirements and network orchestration and operations controller. Uh, we can have multiple of these uh, you know, spread out in the, uh, in the on the ground segment worldwide. Of course, you have to communicate right through again, either through the uh, uh, op satellites or also ground uh, communication technologies. They, so they do network orchestration operations. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so network orchestration, meaning when we have these slices, right? And somehow they uh, have to somehow orchestrate it. Uh, for example, in terms of interest slice resource allocation, they are done by these controllers for example, or subcontrollers. And network operation part, you can see here, again, uh, there are five layer functions, uh, selection of frequency band, channel bandwidth, modulation coding uh, uh, scheme, what we would need to decide, transmission power and number of antennas, MAC layer functions uh, like QS and channel aware prioritization scheduling and network layer functions in terms of packet size optimization and also for the access, you know, routing, for example. And then we have virtualization manager. Again, uh, it's deployed here on the ground segment. As you see here on this, they can be in one big data center or they can be spread out, let's say in Finland in different locations, right? It doesn't need to be always in the same location. Uh, so they operate uh, 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 the so-called uh, schedulers in the SDN uh, language They are called hypervisors, like, you know, the schedulers in different levels of schedulers that's also used heavily in the 5G systems, for example you know, like edge uh, hypervisors and, you know, the core hypervisors, et cetera, right? And uh, so they can uh, make physical resources uh, as virtual resources, right, through this. And then we have policy and orchestration layer. Each tenant has its own uh, policy and orchestration sub-layer and uh, that uh, we have uh, policy issues uh, uh, like over the northbound access point interface routing, scouting, load balancing, slice definitions, etc. right? So now this is the design that we have uh, described for the STN NFE case. So we did uh, some more research on this, like about the constellations, uh, designing large scale constellations. Remember I told you that all the existing uh, uh, systems, they have limited number of uh, satellites. So our question was, uh, how many satellites do we need to cover the earth uh, anytime, any place, right? So uh, because it's very important for the network uh, topology design in terms of coverage and connectivity, it also impacts the cost, scalability and eff efficacy of the, of the network. And as I told you, there is no large scale design solution. A maximum of existing uh, cube sets are around 50 satellites only. As I told you, they cover a certain area and then they have to come back. And, and then majority of these existing systems, they focus on coverage over certain parts of earth than over connectivity of CubeSats uh, covering the entire earth, for example. So the focuses are different. So now I uh, show you again, these uh, uh, existing technologies. And uh, I just remind you how many satellites they have right here. And again, they're always covering certain parts. So our uh, design framework, again, there are many details. This is published in Internet of Things Journal. So we have this input orbital eccentricity, ground visibility constraints, link distance threshold between the uh, uh, CubeSats, coverage requirements, connectivity requirements, and maximum number of CubeSats available. You know, what is our budget, for example? And our algorithm will cuff out number of orbital planes, number of cube sets per orbital plane, orbital altitude, inclinations, and system phasing parameters, right? 
So due to the time limit, I cannot show you the entire uh, framework of this uh, algorithm, how we find out these optimum constellation configurations. You can see there are five steps or six steps, and then we bring out all these optimum heights and inclinations and number of orbits, number of satellites per orbit, etc. cetera. So, uh, so now that's the, the details are here. You can look at the slides and the paper, but the, again, I removed a lot of details. So what are we, uh, what did we receive? Uh, I mean, obtain or learn. So these are like age, the stars meaning optimum numbers, right? Heights, inclinations, etc. For example, if I have a 500 kilometer interstellar links uh, uh, distances, the heights right uh, the, for the orbit 862, then I is the inclinations 78.35, number of satellites 16, and number of planes are or planes are seven. So you multiply seven times 16, then you will get total number of cube sets. And the phase difference between planes is like one all the time. So now let's look at the 2,500 kilometers or 3,000, let's say. We have the height 759 kilometers and inclination 76. And we have 17 uh, number of satellites and 28 orbits. So you multiply that, then you get uh, the number of uh, uh, total number of CubeSats for the entire coverage. So now we have also uh, uh, another paper which we published in Globcom with uh, my uh, student who also graduated uh, in April. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't uh, uh, want to go to academia. He got an offer from a good school, but he decided to go to Open Network Foundation in Stanford uh, Research Institute. And it's also a top place to conduct research in STM and NFE, right? So, uh, so we have this paper. We also apply for patent through Georgia Tech. Uh, so we are uh, we are trying to find these. Uh, you know, how do we find the optimum path from one end to another, right? So another again using the STN, right, from the ground segment, and then we will try to find the optimum path from ingress to egress nodes in the. Uh, you know, in the satellite constellations. So the uh, input for our segment routing is CubeSat constellations, link parameters, flow source, flow. Flows are the flows, right? Again, I hope you know what the flows are in internet uh, language, you know, uh, flows and flow destination, flow demands like quarter source demands and flow durations. And then we have all these, you know, there it's running again in the controller on the ground, do not forget that, right? And so uh, our algorithm is here. And then outputs are, we will get the equivalent network topology, segment routing parameters and set of optimal tunnels, meaning again, tunnels the language in the internet that we are trying to find pipes from one end to another, right? So uh, this is the, you know, uh, again, uh, due to time limit, uh, I will just give you the ideas. Uh, uh, so what we do here is we have these uh, Voronoi uh, tessellations. And then we say that each uh, CubeSat is responsible for a Voronoi region. However, this uh, CubeSat is, we call this virtual node because they are moving all the time, right? So that means uh, it doesn't matter which satellite will be here or CubeSat will be here. This is called virtual node. Right, uh, and then it's responsible for this region. So we have that idea first, and then so that's called the virtual nodes represents the uh, cube sets actually, and then the connectivity between these virtual nodes are realized through the intercellular links, which are representing the edges in our graph model, and uh, then the intercellular links availability is characterized in terms of link persistence. That means how long a link is alive over certain times, right? So then what we do here is we use routing metric on persistence. Persistence meaning like the link is alive, distance between the uh, 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 tube sets and their available capacity. So what we try to find this year, as you can see here, uh, we have these middle points like here. This is the 
constellation here, right? So these are all the virtual nodes we are talking about. This is the ingress, this is the egress here. And so what we try to find is uh, based on these routing metrics, uh, we find the uh, middle points, like say M1, M2. Then we create these segments between M1, M2, uh, I, F, and M1, and M2 and EF, and you know segments. And then accordingly, we create these flows. And this is the way that, you know, like uh, remember from this uh, MPLS type, uh, these are the uh, flow identifications and they come here and then, you know, they will be forwarded to the egress nodes, okay? So here the middle points, these are the nodes which are well connected to all the neighbors, right? They have maximum ins and outs. And then we have these segments. And then as I told you, and then the tunnels, right? That's one tunnel another one, another one, right? So one segment, one segment, one segment, and then uh, uh, the tunnel here, these red areas. So that's the routing idea. So we, uh, uh, again, there's no time here. What we did is we uh, reduced the signaling, as you see here, from the classical STN application by almost half, 50% uh, signaling uh, traffic reduction. Because one of the problems of the STN idea is that you do a lot of signaling back and forth between these, also in the terrestrial cases, right? The controller signals to the open flow switches back and forth. A lot of research has been done there, but also now we are looking at the, uh, the space segment. So we try to reduce the control traffic, right? Signaling traffic. And with, with our idea with the segment routing, we can really decrease the traffic uh, control traffic by 50%. And now this is the last couple of slides, uh, network slicing. My uh, student, Ahan, will give a talk there and they will establish the, uh, the, the time uh, and day. And so he will talk more about this network slicing. That's really up and coming, the automatic slicing 5G and 6G. So we have all these different use cases, right? They have all these different quality of service requirements, throughput, latency, priority, trade-offs, et cetera. And then they have all these use cases with the same integrated space ground infrastructure. Now the question I'm talking about from the physical perspective, how do we enable multi-tenancy and functional isolation between heterogeneous services? Uh, how about network slicing, right? This is again on terrestrial networks investigated since many years, at least seven, eight, nine years, but now the, the notion is called automatic slicing, right? So the classical approach, as I told you, network slicing is you provision multiple services, that means slices in isolation over a common infrastructure substrate, okay? That's the network slide. The classical approach is slices are described in terms of their resource and raw requirements. And they are not suited, you know, the problems of that is not suited for deployment or heterogeneous hardware, lack of consideration for service leg level agreements and absence of use cases, use case customability, okay? So, uh, oops. Uh, so we have this uh, paper, uh, automatic network slicing. We have these inputs space ground infrastructure, terrestrial nodes, the gateways, and the CubeSat constellation. I showed you how we did this constellation calculations. Infrastructure resources, capacity, bandwidth capacity, uh, link bandwidth and capacity, computing capacity, power budget, and slice parameters, endpoints, and service level agreement metrics. And again, uh, this is running on the uh, on the ground segments, like on the controllers, like admission control, route computations that we use the segment routing there, resource allocation ideas. So we did all this optimization framework that Ahan will present you all the details from this paper. And then we can calculate this network topology construction, set of admitted slices, path computation for admitted slices and resource allocation for admitted slices, okay? So now there are these uh, uh, service level agreement model and slice design, all these metrics, throughput related, latency related, overall service matrix, metrics, and use case based slice design, emergency communications in space, cellular backholding, remote industrial automation, and monitoring reconnaissance. So these are kind of like the big picture about uh, slicing uh, uh, design parameters, right? 
and I hope you are getting the point. And so you can see we have all this uh, entire framework slices input during a certain epoch with parameters and service level agreement metrics are given. And we have these uh, our framework that I briefly explained to you, uh, like set of admitted slices, slice node mapping, slice link mapping, and linearization procedure, and the, like link delay linearization, reformulation of the linearization technique for power consumption, and the resource allocation decisions, right? Slice node and slice link resource allocations are the results of this. So we have uh, all these. Uh, uh performance results unfortunately i have only one minute left so you can see all these different uh, uh use cases and, and then you know with different slice numbers for 16 and 28 and then you can see here that the uh this green one the link capacity that's the lowest one in terms of resource utilization why because we have these very high terahertz band communication links, right? So it's not affected at all. But the power, I mean, the node, uh, like computing power of the nodes and also the energy, they are really hampering here, as you can see here, when we have more and more slices. And, uh, and, and so, and similarly, we have these different use cases and we try to uh, uh, achieve their uh, uh, service level agreements, the threshold, and the maximum uh, thresholds, again, we show you here again. Unfortunately, I cannot explain all of that. So what we showed you here is, again, really, I bombarded you with tons of information. Uh, we talk about hardware design. We talk about how we can do STN and FE. And there are many, many research open issues. I mean, it's not like done deal, right? So uh, hopefully, they will give you some ideas to conduct research and start something new. Again, please try to find an angle what you can and you know uh, uh, put on top of these right not like you know repeating similar things right so i thank you for listening to me it's uh, again uh, what 10 16 almost one hour and i'll be glad to answer your questions again thank you thank you for the excellent lecture very uh very interesting results and food for thought paving way for next uh developments in space technologies and uh, now we have uh, some questions from the audience. So we have the first question from, from uh, Jan Prax. Uh, and the question is about uh, how to achieve new shared frequency distribution by ITU for space. Oh, uh, you are talking about spectrum sharing, I assume, right? Yes, so I this is an interesting question, actually. And this is uh, a, a lot of research is being uh, conducted. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the exact ITU uh, uh, guidelines, but I know that uh, uh, like following the research, I was serving on the panel last week for uh, spectrum sharing uh, program. And there is a lot of research going on for spectrum sharing, like for example, radars or also satellites like space and also the terrestrial frequency bands. And this is really an open issue, right? So uh, uh, since you asked this question, uh, this is really a, a, a sore wound. In other words, like a lot of people are again, blindly uh, started to do terrorists, right? Oh, terrorists, let's write papers. But the problem is the terrorist bands are not uh, freed, you know, they are not available. So, uh, so that would be an interesting thing. Like, when will the uh, ITU or these uh, uh, spectrum uh, allocation units or agencies will uh, come to a conclusion? Say, okay, they are freeing these uh, very high frequency bands so that you can utilize them. So, what we do here is now we just conduct the research, and then when time comes and hopefully they will open up those very high frequency bands and we can utilize them. But for the time being, let's say like, you know, a lower frequency bands, uh, like, you know, uh, lower meaning, like it's not that low, right? 60 gigahertz millimeter wave bands, terrestrial, and they're also allowed for the uh, satellites, right? So and then you have to do spectrum sharing not to create uh, interferences to each other. Similarly, lower frequency bands are also available there, right? 
So uh, uh, not only that, but also you can use these uh, cellular phone frequency bands. Again, uh, spectrum sharing is a big problem to avoid interferences between satellites and all the other terrestrial networks. So I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Uh, then we have Walter Niemi asking about uh, security. So uh, we have uh, the identity-based authentication and he's asking that who provides identities and who generates keys for authentication? Uh, okay, here's a, I had some slides, but you know, I do not conduct research on security. I used to do security research in 1985, 86. I did a lot of research for nat uh, a national security agency here and I got out of it. I'm happy that I got out of it because I do a lot of international research and each time I travel in and out of the US, they take me to the back and ask me a bunch of questions. Thanks God, I'm not working on security so that I have less problems. But you know, you, you have a good point. Here's the thing. So the security, uh, the, all the security mechanisms will be in the network controller, right? And then some entity will be running these network controllers, right? So either like private or some uh, uh, government agencies, so that the key management, again, I have these slides for the controller design for security, but I removed it. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that will be the case. Uh, and it's really very important as you all know, even forget the uh, space case for the terrestrial STN and FV security is a, again, a sore wound uh, because it's an open architecture and it's very vulnerable to these denial of service attacks etc but thanks god a lot of uh, guy i mean uh, colleagues are doing research on that and it's thanks god it's working well because there are a lot of deployments in stn and fv for terrestrial cases they work well you know i don't i didn't hear any major problems right okay uh, okay we, we have some that's an important questions question. still coming in but now i believe yeah, it's also we, open we, we, research, we need right? to kind of conclude uh, due to the time but it's been very interesting so thank you again for the excellent lecture and for the insights and, uh, and now uh, we can we can conclude and uh, as mentioned so the recording will be available online so now uh, thank you again uh, thank you for the audience for the questions and uh, being here and everyone uh, stay safe take care and have a great summer thank you I thank you Sasu and I thank you all for listening to me and uh, I also wish you the best uh, summer for all of you so that we can go back to normal lives and I hope I can come to visit uh, Helsinki and then start to work with Sasu and his group and do some uh, good research. And uh, so hopefully we'll see that. Okay. See you guys. That Thank you. Great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.